Take it away. All right, guys. Thank you. Um, so I'm up here to talk about what's actually on your network. Uh, I like the fact that they put me on day one because a lot of what I talk about with my customers and what my prospects is about identifying what's on your network so that you can understand what it is you're setting your network up for, what you're securing the network for. You got to know who your users are in order to be able to service them and give them what they need on that network. So let's dive into this. So quick bit about me. Uh, you can see I've had a variety of, uh, of, of uh, industry experience. I've been in this industry, I can now say, over 20 years. And of that, all but four of it have been Wi-Fi. Uh, so a, a couple different places, um, manufacturers, uh, as the customer at a higher ed, as well as at a bar. One of the things I want to talk about, I kind of go through the agenda, uh, is you can explain the concept. But we're going to quickly dive into just talking about what we have seen on the network at Nyansa. I'm going to tell you about my data set so that you understand who my users are and, and how, you know, how big a data set that is. But in the end, we're just going to kind of talk about why collecting this data matters. Uh, it, it's going to kind of build on what Bob, Bob Friday talked about earlier. Uh, and he'd even talk about what uh, Tufet talked about as well. So the data set. Uh, I think this is important. If I'm going to make inferences about what I've seen on the network, you've got to know what I'm looking at um, you know, where those inferences are coming from. So this data is going to be coming from the half a million APs that we see in our system. Those are from our customers. It's about 17 million clients um, across all verticals, uh, as you can see down there, across a bunch of different vendors, uh, manufacturers of APs and switches. Uh, so the, the goal here is that you understand where this data is coming from. Um, I think that's pretty important. Now, one thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point out is I call out those four verticals there because often in Nyansa, we keep those verticals separate. I don't see the point in uh, explaining or talking about what's happening in healthcare to retail or vice versa. Uh, this is a very different experience, right? What's happening in higher ed versus enterprise. So we're going to keep those verticals separate. But the various manufacturers of networking gear are going to be mixed up. Uh, in terms of, you know, a healthcare experience for a Cisco AP versus an Aruba AP, in the end, the clients are the same. And so what those clients are seeing, what those clients are doing, can, is applicable and is comparable. So let's get in that first data set. Oh, oh, sorry. I have one more slide just to kind of set things up. Um, so we collect our data as close to the user as possible. I think that's pretty important. Uh, Bob talked about user experience, right? That's going to be our new metric. Uh, and, and I talk about this a lot as well in my sales pitches, is that we're going to be talking about collecting that data close to the user. Because if I want to understand user experience, I've got to be able to see that actual user experience and not just what the data center experience is. I'm going to define a couple of key terms here that are going to be important to us. As we talk about industry categories, we're going to talk about that healthcare, that retail, that higher ed, and uh, enterprise. Those are the key verticals that we work in, and that's going to be the ones you're going to see me continue to talk about uh, throughout this presentation. I think those are all pretty self -mentory. Uh One thing with retail is that when I say retail, I know all the salespeople, there shouldn't be too many of them in the room, they think storefront, right? Because if, if you're in sales or you're in SE or you're in the VAR world and you say, hey, I want to go after Lowe's, I don't know who it is. They think about all those Lowe's stores, right? And there are dollar signs in their eyes. But if you think about what's interesting from a Wi-Fi and networking perspective, it's more the back end. It's the warehousing. If you think about all those stores in the mall, uh, interesting, extremely difficult to solve, right, to, to, to network. But it's the warehouse. It's, 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 it's the back end stuff that, to me, as a network engineer, I find more interesting. And there's more insights to be gathered from there. Now, I also say there I want to define the capable devices. I think that's important. You're going to hear me talk about 5 gigahertz capable, DFS capable. Um, what I'm telling you is that this is a device that's on the network that I've seen do that before. I've seen this device attached to 5 gigahertz. I've seen this device attached to DFS. So that you understand what I mean by that when I talk about that in our system. Now we can get into some data. So the very first thing here. Over a third of the access points I see on networks across the world are 802.11n only. Now, my, uh, my, my manufacturer SEs, I, I know y'all love talking about AX today, but we haven't gotten AC all the way deployed yet, obviously. 
have we? We're still seeing a third, over a third of our EAPs out there as 802.11n. And what's even scarier, you can barely see it up there. You see that 0.32%? That's 802.11b access points. The really, really old stuff. Specifically, that's 1,156 of them. So, what I, so I know in this world, this conference, we're going to be talking a lot about the Ferraris and the Lamborghinis of the world, right? 811AX, all the new stuff coming. But we have to remember, there's still a lot of Toyota Celicas on the road, and there's even a couple of El Caminos. Things drag out. Our healthcare people, they like to run stuff until it dies because it's a bear to get in the ceiling. Um, if you go into that warehousing, remember my discussion about retail. If you go into warehousing, they will run it as long as they can. I swear some of these warehouses use technology existed when Fred Flintstone was working. It, it, it's, it's old stuff. So you, you think about that. There's 1,100 H11B 11 access points out there. I mean, I even had to, I had to go back and research. I can't even figure out what AP model that is. I mean, even the Cisco 1100 supported G. So these are really, really old APs that are out there and still on the network and still being used. So just keep that in mind. Now, let's flip that. Let's go look at the Lamborghinis and Ferraris. I know this year, uh, or last year this time, that concept of an SDR, or dual 5 gigahertz, was the hotness, right? Well, 16% of the access points I'm seeing in the network today, out of that half a million, are dual 5 gigahertz. Now, that's interesting, um, and I'm, I'm a big advocate of this concept. I like the concept of dual 5 gigahertz. I think it has a big play in high-density environments, which we see a lot of. But we can see that not even a fifth of the network a very, very small percentage of the network is actually out there and running that type of networking today. So I find that kind of interesting to see those trends and understand, hey, we've got a whole lot of Toyota Celicas out there, not that many Lamborghinis. What about channel width? We like to, I like to talk about channel width all the time. I have a lot of customers I talk about this with. If you look at these three verticals next to each other and you look on the, your left, yeah, my left, on, on the healthcare side, if you go look at that, 96% of their APs are running 20 megahertz wide, 5 gigahertz channels. That makes sense, right? Healthcare is a lot of clients. A lot of what May just talked about. IoT, uh, IoT is alive and well and thriving and been there for years in healthcare. So they realize that. They figured that out. Enterprise, kind of the same way, right? Is that, hey, the, you know, 86% of their devices are 20 megahertz. Okay? They realize that maybe I can use some 40 megahertz, maybe in certain departments or certain um, conference rooms or something like that. That looks pretty healthy to me. The head scratcher for me is that blue pie piece in the middle. I don't know who's telling the universities 80 megahertz is a good idea. Please stop. That's my opinion. Okay, and I'm certain there's some CWNEs in here that will argue with me about it. But I don't see. I've yet to see a use case. And for the record. I live in the middle of nowhere. The next access point outside of my house that's close to me is a mile away, and I don't use 80 megahertz, much less 160. So it's, I find it interesting that a, a fifth, 21% of the access points in higher ed that we see today are running 80 megahertz wide. I find that just a little bit scary, you know, just, just very interesting. So what about negotiated speed? And that negotiated speed by client. So this is looking at what speed, um, you know, that they've negotiated, the maximum speed, so we can understand what that client's capable of. Again, in healthcare, a lot of 802.11n. Not a big surprise, right? Okay, but an equal hand of AC versus AB or B. So that kind of gives us an understanding of where we are in healthcare. Enterprise, again, not a big, big surprise. Uh, even in EDU, we can see that EDU has the biggest collection of AC, um, often higher ed, K-12. through Those are our early adopters, right? Uh, and we can kind of see that. that they're, they like to get that new stuff. Often they get some funding to help them with that new stuff. And so we can kind of see that, that that is following that trend. Now, if I, I like to look at this metric. This is actually a really good metric, in my opinion. And, you know, how a uh, vertical or how a customer is doing in terms of their deployment, how well, how well they followed the wireless engineer suggestions in terms of access placement, number of access points. I'm going to talk about real quick here. I'll talk about good, and I'm going to counter that with bad right below these graphs. What do I mean by good or bad healthcare, education, or enterprise? What I mean by that is that if I took 10 hospitals, 
half of them are going to be above average, half of them are going to be below average, right? In terms of just Wi-Fi performance. When I talk about Wi-Fi performance, which specifically I'm talking about here, I'm looking at a lot of different metrics, uh, and, I, and I'll be happy to talk to you about this outside of the presentation. This isn't about Niantic, this is about the data. But we're looking at things like SNR, L2 packet retries, environment, all that sort of stuff. So just say, hey, half of them are going to be good, half of them are going to be bad. And what we can see here is that in healthcare and in education, the good networks have most of, the, most of their users, zero to 10 users per AP. Makes sense, right? You know, the APs aren't overloaded. We can see in, inter, in enterprise, a good chunk of them are at 10 to 30, okay? So enterprises can be a little bit more resilient of more users on an AP. But now watch what happens to the red sections when I show you the bad networks. Notice that in healthcare, that 76% becomes 60%. And so that yellow pie gets bigger, right? So we can see that in healthcare and we can see the same pattern in education. So what are we seeing? Is that the, the networks that aren't doing as well, we're starting to have more users on the AP. That makes sense. That follows, right? But look at the reverse trend in bad enterprise. They get in the bad enterprises, they have more users or have fewer users on the APs. So what does that trend tell us? Well, I'll answer my own question. That trend's telling us that we've got a couple of enterprises out there that think they're high density, and they're not. That that's the, the, the classic point that everybody in this room, uh, I hope everybody in this room preaches frequently, that there is such a thing as too many access points. And I think that's what we're seeing right there in the enterprise. Um, I happen to know who a couple of these bad actors are, and I'm frequently talking to them about, hey, you might want to turn some of those access points off. No, you really don't need 10 APs over your five-member marketing department. <laughs> Things like that. So, 5 gigahertz in DFS. DFS is that, that big, bad guy that we always talk about, right? Oh, we get these extra channels in Uni2, but oh, we got to use this protocol, and oh, there's, that, there's devices that don't support it. Is that true? Okay. So, if I told you that out of that 17, it was over 17 million, 17 million devices I've seen at Nyansa, 70% of them support 5 gigahertz. I, that jives. That makes sense to me. That doesn't surprise me. There's a lot of handhelds in retail. Remember, warehousing. There's a lot of handhelds in, in warehousing that don't use 5 gigahertz. That doesn't surprise me at all. There's a lot of IoT devices that don't support that. How many of y'all use the, I don't know what it's called now, Ring Doorbell? I remember when I got the very first version of that. They didn't know what 5 gigahertz was. They didn't even know what uh, G speeds were. I don't think they knew what 54 meg was. And they wanted to do video. So if 70% of my devices are 5 gigahertz, of those 70%, 73% are DFS capable. So three quarters of my 5 gigahertz capable devices support DFS. Now again, I'm going to remind you, when I say capable, that means I've seen them attached to a, five, to a DFS channel, okay? At least once. Are there networks out there that don't have DFS deployed? Yes. So is that going to skew this number slightly? Potentially. Okay. But what does this tell us about all devices on the network? 51.1% of all devices that, I've, that Niantz has ever seen are DFS capable. So what does that tell me? Is DFS something I can use or not use? Um, it looks like Sam has left the room, but I was going to quote Sam Clements here and say it depends. It's the, it's the classic Sam answer. But yes, it does look like we can start to use more and more of this concept of DFS in our networks. The, the, this is a good thing to use. A couple of fun facts I'm going to throw out here. Uh, this, this, some of these should look familiar. Uh, we've shown these in the past. 0.36% of all devices support 802.11b only. They've never attached faster than 11 megabits per second. That's kind of sad. But at least, the, at least it's small, right? At least it's a small network, a small number. I've seen 89 Blackberries in the history of Nyansa out in the world. I think the last time Nyansa presented here was something like this. It was 22. Okay, so that, to me, that's just still amazing. That, th those two might be related to each other. I'm not certain. <laughs> I've seen 26,000 gaming consoles on the network. 
Now, I do, you, I do support universities, and I'm certain every one of you is thinking, oh, those are mainly universities. Not necessarily. I've seen Nintendo Switches at banks. I've seen Xboxes at hospitals. I've seen Playstations at, at, at retailers. And the funny thing is, when you call it out to them, they're like, oh, yeah, I'm a bank, and that's our development part, uh, department looking at Xbox apps. No, I that's the one you got hiding in your office you don't want to tell your boss about. <laughs> but so you can see a lot of gaming consoles. And I put that up there really mainly to put this one in context. Tufet talked about smart cars earlier, the Comcast guy. And he said, hey, smart cars are coming. I got news for you. They're here. I've seen 18,000 smart cars on the networks that we support. Think about this. These are cars that have joined your network probably deliberately. Somebody's had to put authentication credentials in. Unless you have an open network. They're getting on your network. What are they doing on your network? I guarantee you that you did not design your network for somebody's Tesla to download the newest version of firmware. Or for their Ford Sync to, get, to go get the latest version of, of music they want. Okay? But these guys are on your network. Okay? So you need to start thinking about that. You need to start thinking about how are these smart cars on my network? How are they affecting it? Hey, if I'm a university, and that's what little Billy got sent to school with, a Ford Sync that jumps on the network, is that, is that something I have to support? Do I have to actually start being deliberate about supporting outdoor networking? Because that sure as heck isn't driving into the dormitory, right? That's something that's not going to ever be able to join the inside network. Now you've got to start thinking about those sorts of things. And 50% of all devices... Our phones. Now, I'm going to qualify the next statement I'm going to make. It's not on the slide. Is that in the United States, which is where a predominant amount of our networks are, iOS is an overwhelming majority. It's greater than 80% of the, uh, those phones. So just think about that. Why do you care about that one? How do I design my network? I've got to know what target device I'm designing to. That tells you right there that if you're designing your network to what your users are using... Chances are, it's one of these. It's an iPhone. So be thinking about that as you go to design what the next gen of your network is. That's what I need to design to. And I'm seeing those iPhones in the use case at healthcare. That's how they're doing the nurse call stuff and doctor call stuff. I'm seeing them in use case in retail as that's how they're doing scanning and barcoding. So it's not just my personal device. These are actually being used in production in the actual use case of your, of your network. Oh, oh, sorry. So let's talk about user data. How are we seeing data on the network? I love to talk about megabits per, you know, per u, megabits usage. Who's the biggest user on your network? But for this point, for, the, for this, this conference, I wanted to see which vertical was using the most data. And it wasn't a big surprise to me that it was higher ed. But you can see that in higher ed, it's a good bit more than even, even healthcare in terms of the amount of data that's flowing. Now you look at that and you start to thinking, okay, that's probably going to be my D1 football schools, right? My Texases, my Wisconsins, my Stanfords. And when I looked at just raw amount of data, it was. But when I looked at data per user and I started to put that number in context, those schools, the D1 football schools that can cram 100,000 people in their stadium fell way down the list. And it was little small schools that started to bubble up. And I found that intriguing. I'm not going to name the number one, but if I did, you'd all know it. But it wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be one you'd expect. You'd probably sit here and scratch your head. And the same thing was true in the other verticals, is that if I said, hey, the number one retail was X. Okay, that makes sense. But the number one retail by user, you're like, who's that guy? That doesn't make any sense. Found that really interesting. All right, so healthcare, you're here, you're looking at it, you're saying, hey, look at us, we're number one, we're passing the most data. I've got a little bit of news for you. When I compare it to Netflix usage, I really hope that higher ed, you're very happy with your streaming media delivery network. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll notice that in healthcare, it's not as bad, but in higher ed in particular, that's pretty rough. Is it? Yeah. What did you design your network for? To be able to stream Netflix. In most of my higher ed admins in the room, I've been there, I've, d I've done that with you. We realize that. It's not what we like, but it is what it is. That's the reality of the world. 
So why do we collect all this data? Why is Nyanta doing this? Why was Bob Friday talking about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning? Okay? I, just, I just gave you a bunch of silly stuff, right? There was some interesting facts, but there, a lot of them were kind of silly facts. But what's interesting to us is the fact that we can take all this data and start to, to munge on it and do what Bob talked about with machine learning and, and, and artificial intelligence to figure if we can dissect what's going on in the network in such a way that I can predict something in the future. Bob talked about trying to solve help desk tickets. Forget that. Let's solve the problem before the help desk ticket even comes in. And that's what we're trying to go with this. And to be fair, Mark's, uh, Bob said if you see marketing, what, PowerPoint slides, that's marketing AI. This is marketing AI. That's fair. But these are the sort of equations we're trying to do behind the scenes. And it's definitely not Jeff Haydell doing that. Uh, but we're trying to say, what can we do with machine learning to predict performance on your network and predict problems before they even happen? This is what we've seen so far. This is how accurate we've been in trying to predict problems on networks that we're not even installed on. So maybe we're installed at half of your locations and we're trying to predict what's happening at the other locations. And the reason I show you this today is that as you're going to see more from the industry, not just Nyanza, but you're going to see more from the industry as we start to predict what's going on, we can start to tell you, hey, you're going to have a problem at this location in the next 24 hours. Be ready for it. Or, hey, your cycle of, of usability at this location is going to lead to a problem in the next two weeks. Let's do this to solve that and prevent that from ever happening. It's that whole, if you keep smoking a pack a day, eventually you're going to have cancer. Let's do that for your network. That kind of idea. That's where we're hoping to take this. All right, a couple of quick thank yous. I want to thank my product team uh, for, for giving me all this data. I need to thank my engineering team. That was a lot of data that got munged into 10 slides. But um, that's really, uh, it took a lot of work from their effort to do that, so thank them. And then uh, thank our customers and CWMP for this. Any questions? Anything I can answer? Did Joel, oh yeah, there you are. So a question from Matthew, you can probably yeah. see it there on the screen. What vendors are those AP type stats pulled from? Excellent. So Nyansa supports Cisco, Aruba, a couple of flavors of Extreme, Eris. I'm trying to use the proper name and not the, the old ones. <laughs> I think I covered them all. Uh, but most of, just to be fair, most of those stats are from Cisco and Aruba. Any other questions? Hey, Jeff. Great presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, what about clients that are only 802.11b capable? Do you have any of that data? Like, when we're planning our networks, what percentage do we have to have that uh, are going to allow for B clients? Well, so remember, I, I showed you that 0 0.359, I believe was the number, 0.35% of, of all clients are B capable or that, only B capable. That was access points. Was that? No, I think that was clients. Let's go back and see. Uh, well, I don't want to shirt. Right there. Me. No, that's all right. Uh, you took it away. Yeah, so 0.359 users. So okay. less than a, a third of a percentage point of my users are be capable. Um, so you got you to gotta plan on... Uh, I'm going to screw up the math here. Is that three out of every thousand um, that you need to plan are going to be stumps in the mud? Yeah. <laughs> Which you might say, hey, forget that. You know, guess what? I'll pay for you to get a new phone. <laughs> Any future trends that you see coming? Any future trends? Um, I guess it's probably based on the data that you're seeing. Uh, some things that surprised me as I dug through this data, um, that manufacturers want to sell you more access points, and they're not doing a very good job of it, in my opinion. Um, the fact that we had such a high percentage of 802.11n out there, and such a little percentage of AC. And notice I haven't even talked about AX. That surprised me, personally. I expected to see more of that type of data, and I didn't. So I expect to see a lot of AP refreshes. I guess that's good news for the VARs and the manufacturers. Um, that's the big thing that surprised me. And then the big thing in the future is using this to predict it. If I can solve your problem before you have it, if I can solve the, the help test ticket before you get it, that's the stuff that, to me, gets me, that, that's exciting. That's interesting. 
Any more questions for Jeff? Okay. I think we're all Excellent. good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause. Okay, quick break. Probably less than five minutes.